morning, Christ. Um, I, I will switch to English now. I'm here today to tell you a story. A story about simple, proven, unknown ideas. A story about hope, about change, and about growth. Earlier this year, I was attending Africa Economic Forum at Columbia University, and I was inspired by hope and determination to change the future of the whole continent by all those attending the forum. And I found myself thinking, where do we get our hope? And how come in countries with much higher living standards, we still like to complain about difficulties? It seems to have nothing to do with external factors. It's all about attitudes. And I know that you've probably heard about the power of positive thinking over and over and over again, but I think that we dismiss it too easily and too soon as another motivational speech or a brainwash or blah, blah, blah. But I've seen how much it can help, how it really works, and how disastrous it could be if someone loses hope for a better future. And that is why I want to talk about it today. But let me start with my own little story first. Um, as told here, I was born and raised in Estonia, and I've been living in Latvia for the last 15 years. And as anyone here in the audience knows, Latvians love to tell jokes about Estonians being somewhat slow. So anytime I would tell someone I come from Estonia, I would hear yet another joke. But um, things have changed a little bit since the start of financial crisis, and with the Estonian economy doing so much better, now I'm quite often asked what, to my mind, is the recipe for success for Estonia. How come that countries with so similar past, or, uh, and also recent past, have taken different paths? And I actually found a joke that, to my mind, explains this success. It's an Estonian joke, so there is a benefit for me of telling it here, because I can finally get back at those jokes. So, Estonian, uh, Latvian, and Lithuanian businessmen are asked how much time it would take them to buy a BMW, to get enough money to buy a BMW. So Latvian businessman thinks for a while and says, five years. Lithuanian, as a true neighbor, wants to outbid Latvian, so he says, four and a half years. Estonian thinks for a little more, as um, Latvians would expect Estonians to think slower, uh, and says, seven years. Others are asking, seven years? Why so long? And Estonian says, well, BMW is quite a big corporation as well, isn't it? So, okay, his grasp of fundamentals of finance may be somewhat shaky, but as I smile to this story, I find myself thinking, why? Why not? What if? And of course, there are other factors that explain why Estonian's uh, economy might be successful, successful or why, in fact, any other country might be successful, but I think this success has very much to do with the right attitude. There was a research done several years ago asking people about their expectations from government on how to improve the standard of living. And that research showed some differences in between the way Latvians and Estonians think. So while Latvians asked for more social benefits, Estonians asked for better education to secure jobs. I want you to imagine yourselves in a story. And like in any good story, there is a villain be it a recent financial crisis or any other things that, uh, bad things that happened to our, uh, us in the live, lives, um, there is a damsel in distress who needs to be saved, or in this case, um, illustrated as a sheep, and there is a hero who fights obstacles and difficulties. So the question uh, we should ask ourselves, whom do we want to be? What's our choice? And I ignore those who would love to be villains for a moment here, so do we choose to be a damsel in distress who needs to be saved every time we get into trouble and government to come and give us social securities? Or do we want to be heroes and get a better sword to fight battles ourselves? So now imagine uh, in the story uh, there are two kingdoms. There is this one kingdom, little sad, old-fashioned, called fixed telephony. And that kingdom has a neighbor, very fashionable and expanding, called mobile telephony. That is where me and my company were uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, mobile uptake was raising very fast and uh, our revenues were going down. We were refused a uh, chance to enter the mobile market and so we ended up as being one of the very, very few operators in Europe uh, who didn't have mobile arm. So we were looked at as a bunch of losers. And the question was, what to do? There was a majority of decision makers who thought that the best choice is to do nothing. And actually it was a very reasonable choice as well because the market was going down, right? I mean, there's nothing you can really do about it. And uh, the product was still very profitable. So if you do something radical, you can actually end up losing a lot of money. 
I was working as a brand manager at that time, and I remember being approached by one of my colleagues and um, to ask, asking about um, how, whether we could increase the marketing spending for uh, fixed telephone services so that we could de uh, diminish the decline. And I had been thinking about the need to innovate the product uh, for a while then, uh, and I thought that we need to introduce flat rate. And flat rate means that you have a fixed fee, you can call as much as you want, and there are no extra charges. Um, so at that time, no one was offering flat rates in the market, so that would be a radical change. It was not about changing the pricing structure, it was about changing the whole use and perception of the product. So to my uh, surprise, my colleague agreed to me very quickly and said, that's a good idea, let's go for it. So we got a couple of followers, uh, but the opposition we faced from the majority of decision makers from the rest of the organization was as intense as it could have been. We heard how all business customers would uh, switch to uh, those complex, and that would mean that we lose millions and millions of money. Then we heard that customers would start calling so much that the network would be overloaded and the quality would go down. Um, we kept hearing about how we're cannibalizing all the business and products, and we kept telling other people, look at those bad mobile operators. They are cannibalizing your business already anyway. So we really believed that we needed this product, and we kept pushing it through. And just as we thought that we had reached a happy ending, lawyers woke up. We heard about the threats, uh, court cases, and fines worth of millions, and they told us you have to stop and close this project immediately. They actually made us to write written reports to the management board explaining our actions. We were quite scared. And men, we were happy that we stayed strong because their product turned to, turned to be a huge success. Later on, when we looked back at this project, we realized that it actually was quite an important milestone for many other changes later on in the company. And the reason for this being because we gained some belief in ourselves that we can change things, that we can make things differently. We don't have to be losers. <coughs> so, no one believed that you can raise revenue in a falling market. No one believed that you could enter a totally saturated TV market with no experience in the field and become a market leader in five years. No one believed that ex-monopoly company could actually think of becoming best in customer service and achieve it. But we did it. And if it were not for those couple of few little crazy people pushing those ideas through and really believing in those ideas, we would never have achieved it. So that is where the kingdoms are right now. Our profits used to be half as much as um, the leading mobile operator. Their pro while their profits have gone down significantly, we have stood strong. And last year, our profits were actually bigger. So we are not losers anymore. <coughs> do we have our failures and regrets? Of course, there are many things we did not do. There are many things we did too late. Or there are many things we just didn't focus enough on. Um, and we regret it, just as well as I think Larry Page regrets not following out on uh, social networks. I mean, he knew that it was important, but he failed to do something about it. It took Google seven years to start to do something seriously about no social networking. And now it's a question, maybe it's too late. So everyone does mistakes, everyone has regrets, but I think the important lesson is that it's the things we did not do we regret about, not the things we did. And of course, in business as well, you need other factors to succeed, but if you do not believe in a positive outcome at the first place, you don't even start. You need to be optimistic. You need to believe that you can reach your goals, that you can achieve um, your targets and be overcome obstacles. There are many great thinkers and leaders out there who've been talking about the power of um, positive thinking and how it can affect the way we um, act and uh, actually achieve results. Uh, Winston Churchill said, attitude is a little thing that makes a huge difference. And it turns out that it's not just an esoteric uh, blah, blah, blah. There is a science that proves it. Uh, Sean Acker in his TED speech talked about it more, but uh, the important thing I wanted to uh, bring out today was that it turns out that our brains function differently when we are happy. We are actually more creative, we are more intelligent, our intelligence uh, rises and our energy levels are higher. So it means that we are actually able to come up with better solutions and thus we achieve better results. This is not some mystery, it's science. So the question then is, how do, we, uh, how do we stimulate it? How do we make people more positive? How do we make it happen? 
And there are some who might say, well, positive thinking is something you're born with, and all these stories you've been telling us, it's just about the character or culture or, his or the history or anything else. Well, the good news is that you can train your brains to make think more positively. You can, it's not something you are born with. And there are different methods out there. You can look them up and uh, use it in your own lives. But I wanted to share with you uh, some experience and lessons that I've got from a recent project we undertook in the company I work for. So as an ex-monopoly, we've been working on improving the ways we work. Uh, for a long time now. Imagine a huge ocean liner and trying to maneuver it. I can assure you that that is easier than trying to change a large corporation with a long history. And we've gone a long way. It used to take a couple of months to get a simple telephone line installed. Now it's a half a day. The customer service used to be really, really terrible. It was always customers who were guilty, not us. I mean, our procedures were perfect, right? Customers were dumb. We've changed a lot of things, and it's easier to say what we have not changed. But the most difficult thing always to change is the attitude. And I think that this project uh, is, a, is actually uh, an example of where we managed to change the attitude, and why, that's why it brought results. So it all started with one of the ad agencies coming to us and asking, what is the one thing your customers want to hear the most? And the answer was very simple. Customers love hearing yes. So now we are in the front of dilemma. On one hand, we have this powerful, simple, and genius idea, answer yes. On the other hand, we realize it's not that simple. We can't always say yes, at least not now. So we started to think what to change. And we decided to start with a couple of pilot projects. We picked up certain departments in the uh, company, and we started to work with employees in these departments uh, in order to implement yes attitude uh, into these departments. So the first step for, for employees was to think of the situations where they couldn't provide a positive answer. The next step then was for them to come up with a solution themselves. The results? Amazing. In 90% of the cases, employees were able to come up with very viable, very reasonable, and quickly actionable solutions themselves. And what's... And and another thing we noticed that uh, the cooperation between the departments changed. You know, you can have those, uh, in large organizations, you can sometimes have departments that never seem to be able to cooperate with each other. One says those are like too, too easygoing, they don't think seriously, they don't understand technology, and others are like, oh, those pessimistic, and uh, they never understand it, and they are too technological, and so on. So what happened is that we noticed that actually you can uh, make them cooperate more. And how did it work? What employees in the pilot projects noticed that as soon as they said that um, they work for the Yes project, they started to get more yeses. The uh, emails were answered quicker, the uh, employee, their colleagues get more friendly and helpful, and uh, that in turn made them more happy. Because, um, and that was like a virtuous circle. So one feels more happy, so he's more opened. The others see, oh, you're more open, now I communicate with you better, and, and that, Gold went on and on and on. And, um, and as a result, there was 45% of decrease in customer complaints in, uh, in one of the channels in one month. Quite often, it was just ab about making this little step, thinking more creatively. There was a story um, when a customer came into the store uh, with, and wanted to change the defective equipment. And you need to have a check to change the equipment, usually. And the customer had lost it. So instead of sending the customer back, the employee went and looked for that check in our stores, in our systems, and that was a purchase made one year ago. He could have just said no. And the amazing thing that he was so happy about doing this and doing this small step, it's so simple. So what does this story tell us? The lessons what I learned, what we, and we, what we learned, that not only do customers love hearing yes, employees love hearing too. In fact, they love it so much that it gives them wings and they're ready to come up with initiatives and start to cooperate with departments they never seemed to be able to cooperate before. And it is contagious. Some of the other departments have been pulled into the YES project as well, seamlessly. So one of the pilot projects set up an interfunctional team, so now the YES attitude is moving somewhere else. So it is inspiring, it is contagious, and it can work miracles with you with your lives and with your organizations. 
So if you ask, what is this one thing I would li like you to take away with you today? I would say take away positive attitude. Because what I've learned that even though it seems to be an old truth, nevertheless, it just works. And it's worth to try it over and over and over again. So I urge you to keep walking, to keep dreaming, and to keep changing. Thank you.